What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this review of Married at First Sight, Season 16, Episode 14. Let's get into Kirsten and Shaquille. So when their segment starts, they are FaceTiming one another. Shaquille is out of town for work and he left Kirsten behind. So while they're FaceTiming, uh, Kirsten is giving a lot of, I miss you, I love you, I can't wait for you to come back. What time is your flight? I want you to get on the first plane back home to me, you know, being very, very loving, very, very caring, um, you know, and it, it, it looked like Shaquille just wasn't matching that same energy. Shaquille seemed kind of, I don't know if he was distracted or if he was kind of down, but I noticed that he wasn't really giving back to her the, the I love yous and I can't wait to come home to you and I've been missing you. And so it was like, okay, what's going on here? And why is Kirsten acting like she doesn't see this, that she doesn't notice that his energy is kind of low and he's not reciprocating the same type of love and affection that she's giving to him. So uh, when the conversation ends, she calls him right back. She FaceTimes him right back and she says, well, I was trying to blow you a kiss and you didn't blow me a kiss. And so I don't know if Shaquille is the kind of guy that takes to that stuff um, easily. Um, like, you know, the whole thing of like how she, I'm not, it wasn't a big deal. Okay. It was not a big deal for her to FaceTime him right back and say, Hey, you know, you didn't blow me back a kiss. That's not a big deal. People do that. Couples do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you are already having issues and problems, and especially when it's like, one partner feels like the other partner is too demanding and too controlling. Even those little things are kind of exasperated and um, they seem to be bigger than what they are. I think, for example, if Chris and Nicole had did that, if Nicole said to Chris, oh, you forgot to blow me a kiss, I would see it as very cute. But then when Kirsten does it to Shaquille and she's already kind of bossy demanding and she has um, expectations that she wants him to meet when she does it it's sort of like she's being her bossy self and um, he may not feel like blowing a kiss but now he has to do it because she's demanding that it gets done and then it kind of loses its sweetness and its affection when you're doing it because you have to and if Nicole did that to Chris you know Chris would oblige and he would do it happily but it seems like with Shaquille he's being forced to do these things so um, I just you know I kind of that kind of uh, grabbed my attention how with anybody else would have been a cute thing but then with these particular people um it just comes off as you know her being controlling and maybe even kind of needy and demanding and um maybe Shaquille doesn't really take to that so um moving on from there they meet with Dr. Pia so Kirsten when Dr. Pia asks them you know how are things going um Kirsten says oh things are great and Shaquille says well you know it's been rocky and then Kirsten says well you know we have our good days and our bad days our ups and downs so Kirsten she's used to being in control and Shaquille also seems like someone who is used to being in control and it's kind of like you have these two very dominant personalities and each one of them is expecting the other one to bow down or to become the more passive one so Kirsten um no Dr. Pia asks what do they find attractive in one another and Kirsten says that she likes uh she liked it when Shaq was moving boxes now, here you have this man who is extremely accomplished. Um, I don't know if he has a where, where he's at with his degrees. I think he's at his I think he's at the Ph.D. level and he has this wonderful position at work. He's making really good money. Um, he has his own business, you know, where he does the bow ties. He's like a very well-rounded guy. And she says, um, oh, I liked it when he was picking up boxes. Because she's trying to grasp for something that she considers masculine and they go into this discussion of the definition or what does masculinity mean to you. They go into that. But when she was asked the question, what do you find? Uh, no, what was it? I, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, what do they find attractive in one another? She gravitates towards what she considers to be something very masculine. And with all the things that Shaquille has accomplished in his life at the age that he's at, 
I was a little bit surprised. And I understand, you know, uh, for most women, they find it attractive when their man does very manly things, very physical things. But she she did she, like any man can pick up a box. But how many men can say that they have the kind of things that Shaquille has, the accomplishments that he's done? You know, Eris doesn't have a PhD. I don't know if any other guy on that show has a PhD. I don't think Chris does. I don't think Clint does. You're sitting next to a PhD or somebody with a master's degree. I don't know how far he's gone in his education, but he seems very accomplished. And that's the thing that she finds attractive because, and I said this in the very beginning of the season, I don't think Shaquille is masculine enough for a woman like Kirsten. Um, and for her to seek that out in her partner, for her man to be big, strong, Paul Bunyan kind of guy like her father, but she still wants him to make a lot of money and have a good job and, you know, wear a suit and tie to work. Um, for her to for for her to see that as something like, oh, that's what I want to see in my man. It just kind of makes me think that she's probably I don't want to say simple minded, but her expectations are not that high when it comes to finding someone uh, for her to partner with. So Dr. Pia says, uh, Dr. Pia asks her, do you think he's masculine? And Kirsten took a very long time to answer. And she goes, um, well, um, he is, he is. And the way she said that, it was like she didn't even believe what she was saying. She didn't even believe the words that were coming out of her own mouth. So Dr. Pia noticed that it took a long time for her to answer. And Kristen says that she compares Shaquille to her father. And her father, you know, that is the epitome of what manhood is to her. And so everyone, I'm, I'm assuming every man that she dates, she puts them, she puts them up against her dad. And um, when she puts Shaquille up against her dad, my assumption is he does not measure up to what her dad is. So... She says that, you know, Shaquille can be tough and um, because she sees her dad as a really tough guy. And she's like, yeah, Shaquille can be tough. And um, she says that what she's a, the things that, that she likes about Shaquille are that he's kind, he's genuine and um, he's pleasing. He has a very pleasing side and she attributes these things to making her feel secure, his kindness, his genuineness. Um, he's so pleasant to be around. It makes her feel secure and comfortable, but not protected. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I wonder how Shaquille must be feeling to be hearing this to this woman who's his wife. And Kirsten has to speak her truth. If this is how she really feels about her husband, she has to speak her truth. She has to say it. She should not sugarcoat it or hide it or whatever. If this is how she feels, they need to get it out so that they can move past this and fix these problems. But I'm thinking to myself, I wonder how he must feel because I always like to, you know, turn it around and put myself in that position. Like, what if my husband said to me, yeah, you know, I like Cookie. She's this and she's that, but she's just not feminine enough for me. And, you know, my mother was a very soft and feminine woman and Cookie just, she's just not that feminine. I'd be hurt. I'd be so, so hurt. And at the after party, Keisha Napoleon said that no man wants their manhood questioned. So she says that if something were to happen, she feels like, you know, Shaquille would protect her. And then Shaquille made a joke, but not so, you know, it, it was a little bit of seriousness to it. He made a joke saying, so damn, we have to be, you know, in fear of our lives in order for you to feel protected and safe. Because, you know, he's thinking that she should always feel protected and safe when she's with them. But they have to be in the face of danger for her to be like, yeah, I know he'll try to protect me if somebody was holding a gun to my head or trying to, you know, snatch me up. Yeah, he'll protect me. But any other time, I guess she doesn't feel safe and protected. So Shaquille feels like he has to always prove himself. And he said, ever since we got married, I've always felt like I have to prove myself to you. And he said that it can be very mentally exhausting to live this way. So Dr. Pia says that she doesn't want Shaquille to change um, in order just to please her because later on, this is going to cause resentment in him. He's going to grow to resent her if he has to change who he is just to please her. 
So Kirsten says that she's fine if he doesn't change for her as long as he's meeting her other expectations. What the hell does that mean, Kirsten? Please expound on that. So you're fine if he doesn't change and he stays true to himself as long as, so you have a caveat, as long as he's meeting my other expectations. And I'm, I'm assuming she's talking about like financial and buying her a house and buying her cars. So then they do the intimacy assignment and I'm not going to get into that because y'all to tell you the truth, um, the couples that had to do the intimacy assignment, I didn't watch it. I fast forwarded. it. It's too cringy for me. And I don't know if I'm an empath or what the hell I am, but when I feel like people are doing things that are embarrassing or cringeworthy, I can't watch. I absolutely cannot watch because, um, the fact that they're trying to do an intimacy exercise and there's an entire camera crew plus, you know, one or two producers there watching them I'm thinking how can they be comfortable doing this exercise this is supposed to be intimate and I understand that it has it's a part of the show and they have to show it um for the sake of the audience it has to be shown but I'm like this is not real this is if anything on Married at First Sight I know there's a lot of stuff that's not very genuine and fake and scripted and whatever whatever but if there's the one thing that to me is the fakest of all is when they have to do the when they have to do the intimacy exercise for the couples that are able to get through it, you know, uh, kudos to them that they can get through it with this entire crew watching them. But for the most part, it's just too embarrassing for me to watch. And a lot of them, they kind of make it into a joke. They're laughing, they're giggling, they're not taking it that seriously. And so it's kind of like, what's the point of even doing it? But it's too cringeworthy for me. And I fast forward through it. So if anything really profound was said during any of the intimacy exercises, when they pulled out the, the, the feathers and the... Uh, and the handcuffs and the blindfolds, if anything really profound was said or done, I missed it. I'm sorry. I can't do it. So moving on from there. So they're having a conversation in bed and um, Shaquille says, you know, there's some things that we could work on. And Kirsten acted surprised. She was like, like what? What do we need to work on? And he said communication. We need to learn how to communicate better. So this is where we find out that when Shaquille went on this business trip, the original plan was for them to go together. But he says as he was packing up his clothes to leave, she changed her mind and wanted to stay back. And so he told her that, you know, he didn't like that. And then she says something about, well, if you would have told me that you really wanted me to go with you, I would have gone with you. And then he says to her, but why do I have to continue to reiterate what I had already said? I told you, I want you to come with me. Why do I have to keep saying it? And so... He says something about how, you know, he left for the trip and, you know, she was left behind to go run the streets or something like that. And I know he said that out of insecurity. I know he literally did not think that she was running the streets, but they made a big deal about that on the after party. Um, he, it was just a figure of speech. He was just trying to set, show that maybe he felt a little bit insecure, leaving, you know, his beautiful wife behind while he went off to Tennessee. Um, not to think, I don't think that for a second Shaquille thought that she was, you know, doing anything that she wasn't supposed to be doing. But when he said those words, you know, you were here running the streets. It made me think that he was thinking to himself, she was having a better time without me than she would have had with me. That's how I interpreted that. Not like he literally thought she was with other men or she was bar hopping with her friends or doing something really crazy. It was just that he felt like she was happier to be left behind than to go with him on the trip. So the producer asked Shaquille when he's doing this one on one, the producer asked Shaquille, are you happy in this marriage? And he says, happy is a stretch. He says, I'm grateful and I'm overjoyed, but I don't feel like she truly, she truly supports me in this marriage. I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes that Shaquille isn't talking about out of respect, uh, out of respect for Kirsten, because the way she acts on camera and the things that he says about her are not jiving at all. Like, um, when she was, when they were FaceTiming one another, Oh, I miss you. I couldn't sleep without you. I can't wait for you to come home. Hurry up back to me. And he was just kind of like, yeah, okay. And now he says that he's really not happy in the marriage. He doesn't feel supported in the marriage. And then we find out that they were supposed to go on the trip together, but then they didn't. Now at the after party, Kirsten said that, um, he was very nonchalant about whether she went with him or not. 
Like he could care. He didn't care. He's like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Like she said, she asked him, you know, can I come with you? And he was like, yeah, sure. You know, that's fine. He was very nonchalant, very blase about it. And, um, he says, well, you know, you got friends over there, whatever state he was going to. He's like, yeah, you got friends over there. Kind of like you have other things going on that can occupy your time. Okay. Maybe that's what he meant. Maybe because I think that's what they were trying to say at the after party, um, Kirsten and Keisha, not Pauline. I think they were trying to say something like, well, he really didn't care if he spent time with me or not, because he said that I have friends in that state. Or it could mean that while he's working, she would have a way to occupy herself instead of being stuck in the hotel room. So she tells, you know, at the after party, she talks about how, oh, he was just so blase and nonchalant. Like, he really couldn't care, like, you know, if I went with him or not. And so when he said, oh, you got friends over there, I was like, well, why would I have to go travel to hang out with friends? I can hang out with friends over here. So that's when she decided not to go. And there, okay, it, that, that might make a little bit of sense that maybe he was blase about whether she went or not because, during the episode, she did say to him, "If well, why didn't you express to me that you really wanted me to come with you?" But she did. I don't know if they, I don't know if they edited it out, but I wish she would have said, "Because when I asked to come with you, you acted like you didn't care if I came or not," and that would have given him an opportunity to respond. But we didn't see that, or she didn't say that, or they edited it out. I don't know. But on the after party, she was like, "He didn't really care if I went or not," so I don't know why he was making a big deal about it after the fact when he came back. And I don't know. I just feel like if she had the opportunity, oh, she also said that she stayed back because she um, was also working. So why did you ask to go? If you had, you know, job assignments or if you had something to do with your job, why did you even ask to go? Because she said that she had to show a house and he was very blase. He didn't care if I went or not. And he said that, you know, I had friends in that state as if to imply that you don't you know we're not going to be together I don't want to spend time with you you can go occupy yourself with your friends I don't know so but I feel like if she had the opportunity to go she should have went because he said yeah come with me yeah you can go with me and no matter if it was blase nonchalant because that's all up to interpretation you know they're still learning each other so maybe what she considers as him being indifferent he was like I said you could go. Maybe he didn't want to feel like he was forcing her to come with him. You know, like he 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 made it seem like as if maybe he he didn't want it to seem as if like you need to come with me because you're my wife and everywhere I go you have to come with me. He didn't want to put that pressure on her. So maybe he relished in the idea that she volunteered to go with him. Maybe that warmed his heart. I don't know. They do need to communicate better because that whole situation to me was so fuzzy and so gray. I don't really know what the hell is going on. But at the end of the day, the bottom line, I think she should have went with him. So they do have a lot to work on as far as communication. She wanted him to say, yes, my love, come with me, my dear. I can't go on this trip without you. I won't be able to sleep a wink unless you're right there by my side. That's what she wanted. And he was just like, I told her she could come. And it broke more hard than she didn't. Moving on to Jasmine and Eris. So Dr. Pia gives him a visit and um, she asks if Jasmine is having her needs met. And so Jasmine talks about her favorite, favorite topic is that Eris is not sexually attracted to her. Sometimes I wish that uh, Jasmine would allow him to say that, put him, put him in the hot seat to explain himself more on that. But I digress. So the question is, Jasmine, are you having your needs met? Jasmine says no, um, because he's not sexually attracted to me and we don't have any physical, uh, we don't have any physical touch and that's what I need. Dr. Pia says, well, is there a friendship between y'all? And she's like, yep, mm -hmm. he friend zoned me on our honeymoon. And so Jasmine complains that he doesn't even hug her and she can't even remember the last time that he gave her a hug and they don't have any very meaningful conversations. So when asked, Jasmine says that she's not holding back from him. And I'm like, in what universe? You are so holding back because he says he wasn't attracted from day one. You just completely shut down. Yes, you are holding back. So then she kind of explains herself a little bit more and she says that she was a lot more open in the beginning and she admits holding back from volunteering information uh, to him. Eris says that he tried to probe deeper, 
but she was so nonchalant. Like she really didn't care. She didn't want to go deeper. No matter how hard he tried, she just wasn't going to give him anything. She said that whenever he would try to probe deeper, it was like, uh, to probe deeper. Is that what I said? Um, to her, it seemed like he was just BSing around. Like he really wasn't serious. He was just trying to get through the questions just to ask the questions. So I don't know if they're talking about the same moment because I thought Eris had said that they did that, um, the exercise with the questions in the jar. And I thought he said that after that, they were sitting on the couch and they were sitting on the couch for two hours. And he said that he was trying to get deeper with her, but she just wasn't, um, she wasn't agreeable to that. That's what I thought he was talking about. He wasn't referring to the questions in the jar. He was talking about another moment when they were trying to have a conversation and she wasn't trying to get deeper with them. Jasmine said that when he was going through the questions, and I think she was referring to the questions in the jar, it seemed like he was just trying to get through the questions just to hurry up and, and do the assignment and get it over with. But I thought he was trying to ask questions on the couch after the jar exper experiment. Um, he was trying to ask questions on the couch. And I think that's, and I thought that's what she was referring to when he she was saying, oh yeah, he was asking me questions, but he was just trying to get through it. I don't know what they were talking about, but yes, when they were doing the jar exercise, yes, Eris seemed bored because she was not participating. You know, he was asking her these questions and she was like, oh, I don't know. So he was like, okay, next question, uh, blah, 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 blah. Eris and Jasmine would be like, mm, I can't remember. That would be it. Okay, next question. Okay, Jasmine, blah, 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 blah. Mm, I don't know. You want to answer that? So of course he was going to be bored and just trying to get through the damn assignment because you weren't giving him anything to work with. If that's what you were referring to Jasmine. So she was like, yeah, when he was asking me questions, it seemed like he was just BSing around. So then Dr. Pia asks, how did that make you feel Eris? How does that make you feel that she's saying that you were, you were BSing around and that she's calling you out on acting like that? And he was like, oh, I love it. So Dr. Pia says, you see, that's the kind of guy you are. You like to be challenged. Yes, he wants to be stimulated with something because he's a human being and Jasmine is giving him a zombie. She's giving him um, AI, artificial intelligence, a robot, an automaton. She's not giving any real human emotion or feeling or depth or complexity or anything. So he's absolutely bored with her. So when he's asking her questions and she's just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Yes, he's going to be like, you know, well, let's just get through this damn nonsense so I can go to bed. But if she were to stimulate him in some way, he maybe, you know, he can respond, you know, in a better way, but she doesn't want to stimulate him because she's shut down because he's not sexually attracted to her. The world has come to an end because Eris is not sexually attracted to Jasmine. And so, and I understand that she's in a very tough situation. That's why I said a long time ago, then Jasmine go home then get a divorce. If you feel like he's not worth my time and he's not worth my energy because he's not attracted to me and I'm not going to give him the best of me because he's not attracted to me, then go home. If you're not going to try, go home. Because if a man makes you feel a certain kind of way and you don't like it, it's time to go. Because the more time energy and attention that you give him, there's going to come a time he's going to embarrass the hell out of you. And it seems like that's what's going to happen in the next damn episode when they go out dancing and he chooses not to dance with her, but to dance with someone else on camera. And she has to run out of that dance hall embarrassed when she should have gone home weeks ago. There's two weeks left in this, um, in this experiment, two weeks left before decision day, and you're still struggling. Y'all are still struggling with attraction. Y'all are still struggling with communication. Y'all are still struggling trying to find something in one. It's too late. It is too damn late for things to all of a sudden turn around where he's going to be so deeply sexually attracted to her, and she's going to be able to just turn on this big personality and stimulate him physically and stimulate him mentally. It's not going to happen in two weeks. So she should have gone home a very long time ago because if someone makes you feel some kind of way and they kind of make you feel like a fool and you stay, 
baby, they're going to make you feel like a bigger fool later on. So, um, Eris says that he now has a new understanding of intimacy. He understands now that she really wasn't asking for much because, you know, when she said, you know, he doesn't even hug me anymore. You know, it made him kind of think, oh, okay, so I didn't have to like break her back and, you know, go to pound town on her. All I had to do is just give her a hug and hold her hand and rub her shoulder. Jasmine feels like Eris is only in a little bit. She goes, he only has his big toe in and not the rest of it. Then go home, girl. Then go home. I think she's still holding on to hope that he's going to turn around and, you know, they're going to have this crazy magical moment where they're just going to start ripping each other's clothes off. And um, he's going to be like, wow, you know, this whole entire time, I didn't realize it, but I am sexually attracted to you, Jasmine. And it's not going to happen, sweetheart. This isn't the movies. This is your real boring life. It's just not going to happen. Let's move on to Nicole and Chris. Nicole and Chris, not much happened. Nicole and Chris are doing great. And that's wonderful. We want to see couples doing great. We want to see couples doing great. But then that just doesn't leave much to talk about. <laughs> they installed a bidet. Um, okay. And um, I'm not sure exactly why, because they're going to be leaving in two weeks, because I think they're going to be leaving that apartment to either go back to their own homes or find a home together. So I'm not understanding why they're going through the energy of installing a bidet. But I understand that you can uninstall it and take it somewhere else. OK, so uh, Dr. Pia visits them They talk about their sex life, which is on and popping. No, you know, whatever there. No problems there. Nicole admits that she doesn't get enough foreplay. And Chris didn't know that because she never vocalized that. So Dr. Pia was like, well, you seem like the kind of person where you want to, you don't want to rock the boat. You want to make sure that your partner feels happy and comfortable with you. So you don't want to say things that might, you know, make them upset or make them uncomfortable because if you wanted more foreplay, then you should have told him you want more for foreplay. And there's a billion different ways you could tell him that without, you know, him being offended or feeling like he was lacking in some department. So because Nicole is used to being a people pleaser and not voicing her feelings in the past, you know, she doesn't really express the things that she feels like might make him upset. So Dr. Pia suggests for Nicole, you know, to be more vocal, say what you want, say what you need, and to also to stop self-deprecating, which she does her, she does that a lot, where she's always really down on herself. And Dr. Pia tells her, you need to see yourself the way he sees you and the way that we see you, because Nicole is a very vivacious, attractive woman she's got it going on and you know her whole thing of talking about how oh my past boyfriends you know they were just using me my past boyfriends you know doing these really horrible traumatic things to her you know she kind of still sees herself as that girl who was just going along just to have someone like her um which was it's a habit of hers because she did it as a teenager hanging with the wrong crowd just to be accepted hanging with the wrong men just to be accepted so she needs to get out of that mindset and see herself the way Chris sees her so yeah hopefully she does she does she's Nicole is a wonderful wonderful woman you know to hear her talk she just she expresses herself really well when she wants to um just extremely articulate intelligent she can analyze the situation well um yeah she's a really great great woman and I, she needs to see that in herself moving on to Gina and Clint so they get uh, Pia, Miss uh, Miss Pia, Dr. Pia comes over. They talk about, you know, how they're just the, 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 the intimacy, the sexual attraction. It is dead. It's not there. Dead as a doornail between these two people. And so Dr. Pia says, well, of course it is because y'all don't even try in that department. If you would try, you might spark something. And at first when she said that, I kind of didn't agree. I was like, well, if they don't have that initial attraction, they just don't have that initial attraction. But then I realized when they were um, doing the, um, the questions, when they were asking each other the erotic questions, I realized that there could have been potential there for them to feel that way about one another. Because sometimes, you know, when you are trying it can kind of wake something up in you that you thought was dead and gone, but it's too late for them. It's just too late. If they would have been doing that two or three weeks ago, maybe, but it's just too late for them. So, you know, they're, they're more friends than anything else. They don't see each other in a sexual way. And I don't know if, um, 
if they have any hope. And but they do talk about and I think they have to say this for the sake of the show. Um, they'll say things like, well, if you know, if we decide to, if we do, if we do decide to stay together, um, if we say if we stay together, if we say yes or no, kind of like leaving the door open, there's a possibility that they may say yes to one another on decision day. And it's, I think it's because the show probably doesn't want them to say, well, we've already decided we've already talked about it, we're going to say no. You know what I mean? Because then we're not going to watch but I don't think these people are going to say that there is no hope, zero hope that these two people are going to say yes on decision, decision day. It's just not going to happen. Um, I didn't watch their intimacy exercise. Like I said, it's just too cringeworthy for me. Um, but they're not going to say yes on decision day. There's just no way in hell. Um, I don't think they'll ever see each other again once the show ends and they go their separate ways. Yeah, it's just dead and gone. I think that if Gina would have tried something intimate with him, I think Clint definitely would have gone along with it because she is an attractive woman. He does see her as an attractive woman. It's not he she's not his type. He would pick her up in a bar, but he does see her as an attractive woman. And I think that if she would have um flirted with him just a little bit, I think it could have been on and popping. But I don't think she's that interested in him. That is just not her type at all. And um, just, he's just not her type. I don't know what else to say other than that. Um, that is my little my little review. On the after party, nothing really significant stood out. Um, I did kind of take offense, not take offense, but I kind of didn't like how Keisha and Ipolium, when Kirsten was telling her story about, you know, she wanted to go with Shaquille, but then she changed her mind and the whole thing about the masculinity. Yeah, that's what it was when they're talking about the masculinity. Um, it was kind of like, I don't know, Keisha and Ipolium was sort of like agreeing with Kirsten with what she was saying. Um, no, it wasn't about the masculinity. It was about the trip. It was about the trip. She said something. Oh, yeah. Kirsten said that um, it would have been masculine of Shaquille if he would have taken charge with the whole trip situation. Like if he would have, I guess, told her, yes, you're going to come with me. And then if he would have been like, had everything planned out on what was going to be going on on the trip because she says that before they left before he left um he had nothing planned um yeah because it was like a work trip so I don't, I don't i don't know how much activity she wanted to do in just a couple of days but she said he had nothing planned and if he would have had planned it all out told her what, what was going to be going on from a to z given her the itinerary she would have felt like, oh, that would have been showing his masculine side, him taking charge, taking control of the situation. And then Keisha not pulling was like, yes, yes, making you feel safe. I understand. What? <laughs> so he lacked masculinity because he didn't have a ironclad itinerary. Girl, get out of here. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it on your way out. Don't forget to rate the video if you like this content. Please go ahead and subscribe and I will definitely talk to you later. Bye.